we had a showcase uh, with with a, a couple people, one label and one label. I don't even want to, I can't even remember what it was, but it was pretty big and, and it was legit. And they were like, we're going to offer you a deal. We've sent the memo to the attorney, your attorney, you know, this is going to, this it's going to happen. So this was on a Friday. So we were the whole weekend. Of course, you never do this. You never be like, yeah, done deal. We did. Yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> we like went out to the lake and like uh, a, f- a couple friends of ours had like a houseboat rented and we just partied all weekend. We were like, we're getting signed. Yeah. And, uh, and then Monday morning happened and it was like, yeah, I don't know what happened. It came from upstairs, but, uh, they withdrew the deal. <laughs> oh, like, oh man. I was oh. like, sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Benny Goodman. I'm not going to go through the rigmarole other than I'm here stuck as they are stuck with me too. Corey and Siobhan, Cronin, how are you guys? Pretty Doing good, right. except for, as you will notice, I did not quite make it to the beginning of part one here. Um, you know, we, we get into the story star. a little bit later, but yeah, absolutely embarrassing, um, you know, <laughs> snafu with my alarm not going off in yes. my dungeon of a so bunk. Irresponsible. Oh, uh, so irresponsible. Yeah, if you see the YouTube, you could see Corey and I frantically texting her because we're like <laughs> afraid that Keith Wallen, our guest, who's an incredible solo artist, but also you might know him from a, a little band called Breaking Benjamin. Uh, yeah joined us and he was super cool for being a dude that got baited and switched with like hey Siobhan has his podcast and like meanwhile there's two dudes it's like what's up bro <laughs> right. he took he took it well but uh no he's he's you know super nice guy and and he's got a great story as as usual you know he's, he's in a huge band but he wasn't always in a huge band and he had to go through some things and he's, he's got a good perspective on it so amazing without further ado subscribe to the podcast and check out part one with Keith Wallen Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of 2020. Uh, Corey here with Benny. We are awaiting our, uh, our our rock star co-host Siobhan to hop on at some point any minute. But uh, we're super happy to welcome Keith Wallen of Breaking Benjamin, Adelita's Way, and his own solo project that we're going to dive into, um, who was kind of connected to us from Siobhan. So this will be fun because we get to jump in and uh, and kind of get to know you uh, before your your touring mate Siobhan Cronin hops back on. So thank you for hanging with us, man. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for uh, for having me. Um, yeah, uh, we uh, we I met Siobhan, I guess maybe once before this tour, but this tour um, got to hang out a little bit, so it was awesome. We haven't done a tour with Star Set in a few years and uh you know back in the day i think uh which is not too far away back in the day but like 2015 2016 we were playing with those guys and uh that was back when there was just four dudes so we we show up to this uh tour and i'm just like who are all these people yeah i know but i was like dustin likes to collect uh band members it seems yeah (laughs) yeah but it was awesome i was like this is great everyone was so cool and i mean they're uh, amazingly talented uh all all the girls all the the dudes everybody so it was it was uh it was a blast yeah it's a really fun crew and uh we we mentioned before we started the show um we got to catch uh star set uh you know a few weeks back at mohegan sun in connecticut and you guys were obviously breaking benjamin the headliner so it was really exciting with our Uh, boy Corey from seether don't forget seether yes and and seether yep another one of those bands so let me level with you my brain it stopped absorbing music after Dimebag Daryl was shot. So like, uh, you know what I mean? Like I'm talking to Corey. He's like, uh, like how many number one hits does he either have? I'm like, oh, because I'm like that old disillusioned dude. Like I was saying before, like, you know, with the Metallica shirt that like <laughs> I went and saw your show. First off, the amount of songs between you and Seether that I knew that I didn't know that I knew is obnoxious, actually, because most <laughs> bands don't have the amount of hits like that that I forgot you have. What's it like going on tour where all you, you guys are all just like, it's like three awesome bands. It's like it's four awesome. Cause you have a, a you have the, the chick from Flyleaf. I don't want to call her the chick from Flyleaf, but I don't remember her name, Lacey. but she was amazing. What, what's her name? <laughs> Lacey. Lacey. Yeah. She, oh my God. What a voice. The only pr- problem I have is if I was on this tour, 
I'd be upset that the opening bands were so good because it sets the standard. I like having shitty opening bands if I play with my band so that I know that no matter how bad we are, we still were better than it was. So how does that feel where everyone's just like a rock star on that tour? Uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, obviously, look, I'm one of the one of the new guys that uh, that came into the band, uh, you know, I guess. Oh, it's it's almost coming up on ten years, which is crazy. I think it's like eight years. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, new new, uh, but it's 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 great. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's easy to get up there and and uh, play all these songs that that have been so uh, important for for so many fans, and uh, you know, even from day one, the fans uh, welcomed us with open arms. The you know us new guys and uh and still to this day yeah it it, it uh, it's just it's amazing it's um literally just living my dream you know uh getting to uh tour i mean obviously the last two years have been shitty you know uh for lack of better words yeah. so uh having having to uh, getting to be back out there and and experience performing and experience all the just the, the energy exchange from the fans and everything like that it's just been uh amazing i, I didn't take it granted i didn't take it for granted before the pandemic and i i, I sure don't now afterwards yeah. you mentioned the last two years being shitty and, and that it's funny enough that's the reason we have this show um obviously 2020 uh all right it's, it's, it's become a bit dated now but we're kind of shifting our focus so we started it in 2020 to give us something to do because uh uh siobhan is also when she's not touring the world in our band lost symphony um which is more of a, a studio project uh and so we were trying to figure out what to do in 2020 when we couldn't really all get together not that we can ever do that really it's kind of remote but uh we started this podcast to talk to some of our friends uh, and wh- now how we're shifting it is we're kind of calling it like 2020 to look back at, you know, successful people's careers and like, you know, what following your dreams really looks like. So I guess this would be a good time to kind of dive back and, uh, ask you just kind of how you got your start in music. Uh, and like, what was your first, uh, you know, dipping your toe in experience before being the new guy 10 years ago, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it still feels new to me in, in, a, in a weird way, even though it's been a little bit, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, yeah, I, I guess, uh, I, I got started when, uh, I was fairly young. Um, my, uh, just, just from listening to, uh, some of, you know, the, the influences my dad had back when I was a little kid, he, he played Frank Sinatra albums all the time. He was super into that. And, uh, then, you know, I got a little bit older and just, you know, my, my older, I have older brothers. So then they would, they would leave kind of like, you know, hand me downs and remnants of, of, you know, their childhood, you know, in the house after they moved out, there was like cassette tapes of like Boston and journey and Elton John, not to date myself too much. Yeah. Uh, cassette <laughs> tapes. That's like literally my, actually my playlist when I go to the gym is Boston journey and Elton John. So that's fucking weird. Synchronicity. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Saturday uh, night's all right for fighting Keith. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was cool. Um, you know, kind of getting into that, uh, rock stuff. And then later on, um, my, my buddy, I'd go hang out at, uh, at his house and he'd have a guitar and he'd be jamming guitar. And I was like, man, that's pretty cool. I, I, you know, can you teach me something? And, you know, he taught me a few songs and I just kind of ran with it after that. And, um, you know, started my first band and then I was in another band. Now I'm in the band now, uh, that I'm in so, now. So, yeah. so talk about starting your first band. Cause that, that's kind of the, the jump from like, you know, a hobby musician to like, I'm going to try totally. to do something with this, you know, maybe not if, you know, were you thinking like, this is going to, at that point where you're like, I'm going to do this for a living or was it like, I just want to get together with some friends and start jamming. Well, do you have a, more importantly, before even that, where did you play? Were you in your parents' basement? Did you rent a band space? Like paint this picture for us. So the very first band uh i was in was a band called neptune and it was in west virginia and we basically just played covers and we rehearsed in uh like garages and sheds and everything else any any space that we could fit all the gear and 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 you know no one would call the cops on us uh that that was that was our rehearsal space but um yeah we got a few gigs at a couple local bars there in west virginia and um 
and it was a blast. I mean, we were probably horrible. It was horrible, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, you know, you're, I, I was a young kid, you know, 19, 20. And I was just like, man, this is amazing. And, uh, and I, I, I never really thought like, man, I want to do this for a living. Uh, before that, it was always like, man, I just want to have fun. Let's just get in a, get in a room and jam and see what it sounds like. And then, you know, after getting shows and making a little bit of money, you know, not too much, but just, you know, oh, someone hands you a check for, you know, 200 bucks or something. You're like, whoa, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> for um, playing guitar, what? <laughs> yeah, for just having a blast and, you know, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so then I just really was like, maybe I, I, could try and do this. I know, I know that I didn't really want to do anything else. Um, you know, I went, I went to college and basically just my, my parents were like, Hey, if you go to college, we'll, we'll support whatever you want to do, just get a degree. So I was like, okay. And, and, um, after school, that's when I really was like, okay, now that that's out of the way, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's focus well, what did on you get a degree uh, in man. Because I, I feel like we're from, uh, I don't know how old you are, but I, I'm 39 turned 40 this year. I'm from a generation where my parents were the, were the same way. Like, dude, we don't care what you do. Yeah. Just get a freaking degree, man. Go to oh, school. Yeah. So I can know, I don't have to tell everybody at the, the game that like you dropped out and that you're a loser. <laughs> like, that was the linear method. Where it's like everything that I've done in my life, nothing about school mattered. And like clearly, right you know, the way you glossed over your college education. Like, do you think that that's good for people to go to have to go to college and get it out of the way? Or do you think some people, let's say you're in a band like Breaking Benjamin? You well, know, to me, you, at, to, well, to me at the, at the time, it was not, it was not uh, top of my priority list. And, you know, obviously I wanted to do right by my folks and, and, you know, um, but I really just wanted to rock and I wanted to, play music. And that's, that's really what I wanted my future to be. Um, not saying that I do, I don't appreciate everything that I learned in college and all the experience and, and just, um, uh, I mean, it was great. There's all kinds of things I learned, just, just starting something, finishing it, you know, how to, how to, um, you know, how to be responsible just with, you know, showing up to, you know, exams prepared yeah, and only taking two shots the night before instead of six. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely, I definitely, um, you know, appreciate all that. Uh, and, and, and there's no, there's no reason why, you know, um, someone could, you know, not get a degree and still chase whatever they want to do. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I still feel like, uh, it's a good thing, even though it's pretty expensive uh, and, and, you know, people get in debt. Yeah. Um, well, did you get a degree? I did. I did. In? English. That's good. English. And the reason why is because the reason why is because I hate math and uh, terrible at math. So, you know, just me sitting there in, in the, you know, the advising office, I'm like, what am I going to do? And he's like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I, math sucks what's the opposite of that okay let's do some words english let's go and so then i just started focusing on that and you know took some business classes had like a business minor or whatever but really it was all about writing papers uh had a few poetry classes um it was a lot of reading and I, and i feel like some in some way probably in a lot of ways more ways than i think it probably helps me putting songs together and writing lyrics and thinking oh, about absolutely dude that's yeah. such a so english is such a great thing as far as like if you want to <laughs> be a musician well knowing how to use non basic words when you write things like well is is important also writing emails where you don't sound stupid to people where they're like that's the guitarist <laughs> that's the, that's that's the yeah. drummer clearly he's he's lucky he has an internet connection so like writing and then also ob obviously being able to read and absorb things sure i feel like reading is one of those things where people don't appreciate it as much as they used to because now we have social media so it's like you're reading things all day long so it's like why would i read the big long book but like you know yeah. clearly it helps yeah i think so i mean it, you know about the learning about all the, you know, big, you know, crazy words. I still just write songs and use simple last words. <laughs> yeah. So 
I don't know if that helps so but much. But that's a but. choice. That's still a choice. The True. point is, is that you, you've made a choice and you, you now at least have some knowledge. It's not just like you're trying to be a poet and you're just pulling out words out of your ass. You're choosing yeah. now not to use crazy polysyllabic words so, so you don't sound like an elitist asshole. Like I try <laughs> every time I write a poem. I'm like, how do I fit this, you know, crazy word in there so I sound smart? Right. That's, that's what you like to do on the podcast. For, although you've been you've been better lately with pulling out your your ridiculous. I haven't been so much of a hyper polysyllabophiliac. Yeah, yeah your, your word a day calendar has, has run out. Um, so you know after <laughs> after the college experience, like when did you really kind of decide or or start the the path of like the original music and, and making that a career? Yeah. Uh, so a couple of the guys that uh, you know I. I um, had the the other band with we we started another band called copper and it was uh it was in knoxville tennessee and um yeah we just kind of started writing original music i mean we the, the first few shows we did it was we were playing like frat parties and you know and it was like 90 percent covers you know we just didn't know anything else to play uh but then you know we started to kind of get together and write some more stuff and write our own stuff and we got a little bit of studio time and recorded stuff and then um you know we had we sent a song uh to one of the radio stations and, and met one of the the djs there and he like put it on the air and uh and it was nice. in like radio re regular rotation for a bit so you know it got us a little bit of a following there in knoxville and we just you know we kept on playing and started to branch out regionally and after uh you know a couple albums and about eight years uh, and 12 drummers that that band kind of ran its 12 course. 12 drummers. Is it like spinal tap? Do like any of them actually spontaneously combust? Pretty much. Pretty much. It was, it was like that. It was, it was a lot, but, um, but yeah, you know, um, you know, that kind of thing happens and you just kind of like, well, try to time to try something new and something else. And, you know, we, we had kind of played so many showcases and, I mean, we had we had done it all as far as yeah. you can go, pretty much, is, is for a you know local regional band. So, I feel like that can be that? a tough that can be a tough choice, especially with the first band that you've had some success with, and you know something you put a lot of work into. And it, if you don't have the experience of jumping around, was it hard to kind of make that decision of like saying we've oh, gone yeah. far enough? Oh yeah, it's terrifying. It was terrifying. It was a. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was absolutely terrifying. There's no better word to describe it. You know, I, you know, exactly what you said. I pretty much was like, well, this is it. You know, this is, you know, this is the band. If we're going to do it, this is going to be it, you know. Um, but it wasn't. And, you know, I had to find something else to do. And I had to, you know, get a job, get some odd jobs and try to make some money because it was just like starving artist city. So, um, yeah. When did you get that fire back? Because I'll tell you, like, similar situation. When I was 19, I was signed to a seven-figure record contract. And I always say we were like the Eagles without uh, releasing Hotel California. We totally imploded. We wasted so much money. It was ridiculous. Yeah. But Hotel it was, like, was looking, all this time. <laughs> right. So you like look yourself in the mirror like, I'm never going to do this anymore. I, yeah. This was my chance. But like, you're a perfect example. Pick yourself back up. I mean... What's that? When did you decide that maybe that wasn't it? Yeah, I kind of had two. I had two moments of of uh, you know, kind of highs with a band and then lows after leaving the band. I, I had a couple of those kind of pick myself up moments and come to Jesus. What am I doing with my life? Moments. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think whenever um, I don't know, we just. It, it just ran its course. You know, we just, we, we played a bunch of shows and, um, you know, that were great. And then just, we played some shows out of town that, that were great. Eventually some of those shows were just horrible. I mean, I remember it was just like, uh, I remember I was like 27 at the time. This is like year seven of the band. I'm like, we should be the biggest that we could be at, at, at this point in our career in this band, we should be, bigger than we were four years ago or whatever, just from just the law of building and growing <laughs> right. of, of a band. And uh, I mean, we would play some, some places like, you know, granted be out of town shows and, 
you know, promoters just weren't promoting it. And it was just bad. It's like, you, we've all played those shows where it's like, hell yeah, there's the sound guy. Well, he's getting one hell of a show tonight. You know, it's That's like nine, 90% of my shows. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was gonna say you, I, I you mean, said two hundred dollars for a gig. I'm like, where are you getting two hundred dollars right now? That sounds awesome. Yeah, exactly. like, I want your gig at nineteen. That was uh, that was just an arbitrary number, my guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, after a while, I was just like, I'm getting too old to play these empty places. I felt like sh- shit. I felt like no one cares. I was like, no one is gonna care. Why am I doing this? I'm sick. We're broke. The van broke down again. We need a new transmission. Our tire of our trailer blew out. This sucks. <laughs> and it was just time to do something else. I love those dudes. I, you know, all the guys that, I, that I've, I've played in bands with, I have so much love for them. I really do. Um, but yeah, at, at, at that moment, I was just like, get me the hell out of here. Try, time for something else. Yeah. And the, so, the, next, the next project was that Adelita's Way? Correct. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that came about through, um, you know, while I was going through uh, the period where I'm just like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? I'm almost 30. I'm broke. You know, do I start another band? Do I, you know, this one obviously didn't go anywhere. And, um, um, you know, so kind of options were open and, and I had a few mutual friends that were that were, uh, you know, in the business. Um really close friend of mine that, that worked for Atlantic at the time, he actually signed copper to a a development deal with Atlantic. Uh, and then that was really the one that was, there was one time we had a showcase. I'm, I'm, I'm digressing, but we had a showcase, uh, with, with a a couple people, one label and one label. I don't even want to, I can't even remember what it was, but it was pretty big and and it was legit. And they were like, we're going to offer you a deal. We've sent the memo to, the attorney, your attorney, you know, this is going to, this it's going to happen. So this was on a Friday. So we were the whole weekend. Of course, you never do this. You never be like, yeah, done deal. We did yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we like went out to the lake and like uh, a, f- a couple friends of ours had like a houseboat rented and we just partied all weekend. We were like, we're getting signed. Yeah. And, uh, and then Monday morning happened and it was like, yeah, I don't know what happened. It came from upstairs, but uh, they withdrew the deal. <laughs> and I was oh, like, oh man i was oh. like sweet and i think really after that happened oh man it was like dude after just having your 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 heart just you know muddled yeah uh yeah. it was like all right time for something else but anyway fast forward i had a, a few mutual friends still in the biz and um one of them kind of caught wind about this band that was signed and they were looking for a rhythm guitar player, uh, backup vocalist. And I was like, well, I was rhythm guitar player in copper and I, you know, I did the singing, I can sing backup. Let's do it. And, uh, auditioned and, um, got the job and I was with them for four years. I was going to say, can we just stop for a second though? I, I love the fact that you had that, the houseboat party story because Thanks, like man. that, no, because that happens, man. And the oh, fact yeah. that like, cause like, think about that. Like you're a musician you're like so i could tell i phil and selma calls it being a lifer you know what i mean like you're a lifer you're a lifer <laughs> yeah. like you can't get away from music you're gonna be in bands until it's fucking over dude and like that's oh, yeah. how it is yeah so to have something like where you on a friday you're like everything i've been waiting for the whole culmination of my entire existence and being is about to happen oh yeah and then you drink it's it about to wake be up. fulfilled yeah yeah it's gonna happen like we're finally gonna be able to do it then monday's like just kidding and yeah. Ashley Kutcher doesn't even walk out with a camera. You're like, Fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like that's that's a serious level of humility to be able to still get back up on the horse, or again, Stupidity. be completely dis- disillusioned <laughs> with like the reality of it all, and or, yeah. or having that hubris, you know, where you're just like, but I'm still gonna just do this. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I mean, and those are some dark times. Those those are some dark thoughts where you go through the whole litany of all that stuff what what am i doing you know you know who am i you know you know all kinds of those those thoughts and uh you know i i i joke around i was just like you know at one point at at what point is it just like you're just too stubborn to quit you know you're just so ensconced uh in 
in it that you're just like, yeah. So I can tell I you, think when that you was get it. your fourth keyboard that's 88 keys is when you're <laughs> like in over your head. It's like having a children, a child and a mortgage. Four 88 key weighted keyboards is like when it's over. It's just like you have to do this or you might as well just give it up. Oof. Like everything. <laughs> Those are just so bad. I, I like I'm feeling I can feel it. I can feel that. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> when you uh when you did make that transition and you got you know, you got the gig, so you're no longer like starting a band and building it. You're, like you're hopping into something that's kind of already rolling a bit. Like how was that yeah. for you? Because that's a different mindset, uh almost, you know, in terms of like your your approach, right? Yeah, it was definitely, you know, it was kind of like, uh, I am a cog in the machine. Um, you know, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my job and, uh, you know, make, make everybody sound and look and appear and come across as good as they can. So, uh, yeah, that was my mindset going in and it was fun. It was, uh, it was, it was super cool. It was cool to be a part of a, of a band that was, you know, quote unquote signed, because mm. I didn't know what that was like. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and it was cool. You know, we played some big tours, met a, a, a lot of great people. Oh, here's Siobhan. Uh, she, she is she is gracing us with her presence. Oh, <laughs> Ladies oh my God, and gentlemen, no, the, true, the true rock star of 2020 today. It doesn't matter how many number one hits you have. I am I am level fifteen embarrassed. This is like the I can't even make an excuse for it. I set five alarms, which is really sad because it's fucking one p.m. But we've gone from West Coast to East Coast, and I was like, okay, I have to be up. And the bus was supposed to pull in at like twelve o'clock, and I was supposed to go in and like be ready at one. And I like nothing went off, and I wake up in the darkness, the black hole of my bunk, and I'm like, this can't be true. It's one fourteen p.m. Well, Siobhan, you know you're Dang. notoriously irresponsible I'm so and sorry, and Keith. I'm so unpunctual. sorry. You don't. You don't look like you just woke up. So well, I I took the extra five minutes that I also didn't scare you when I got on the show because I was I was like I can't be late and look like I died. So well, oh, anyway, well, thank it's you all for good. Joining. It's all good. Yeah, I don't care. No, of course. They, thank you for being patient with me. We're we are, uh, we, we've kind of gone through the beginning of uh, Keith's career. Uh, you know, we got through the first band, and, and now we're kind of just talking. You know, once he got into the the world of uh, you know, hired gun and, and, and actually being in a quote unquote signed band. So wait, can we, can we ask <laughs> Siobhan a question? Siobhan, sure. tell me if you've ever had this experience. Cause I feel like you might not have. Okay. So Keith was telling us about on a Friday, his band was told by a huge legit label that they were going to get signed. So they went and partied all weekend. And then by Monday they had redacted the statement. Have you ever had a moment like where you were about to get signed or did you just always wait the Queen's Gambit and just not know that you were a star? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was always sort of the hired gun thing. So I was never like <laughs> getting signed myself to a label. I was always with a band that was getting like, so for example, you're always getting paid. Set. You're well, always paid. Yeah. I mean, I can't say I remember like a big gig getting <laughs> given and then taken away. Um, but yeah, that that's crazy. I did. I miss that story. What happened there? That's every yeah, guy's yeah. story. Every dude that's big in the industry, we have to have those stories. You don't have to have that story. You're like, I always just played like really well. People have always paid me a lot of money because I'm just good. So good no, for you. that's not that's not true. <laughs> but <laughs> it isn't. I haven't had I haven't had any. Well, no, it took a long time to get you know to the point where I can play well. I guess, but it's, there's still competition. There's still things that I don't get. There's still things we all don't get. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I haven't had something big given and then taken away from me. That's scary. Continue on, Corey. I'm sorry. Me? <laughs> yeah, you were about to ask a really important question, but I had to ask Siobhan if she ever went through that same experience that every band dude, I feel like, goes yeah. through. But her being this militant level violinist, it's, it's like she never had to feel that. I think I think what, what the point of Keith's story was it was a good life lesson in terms of, uh, you know, don't count your uh, chickens until they've hatched kind of Definitely. situation. Um, and we knew better, too. Yeah. We knew better. But, you know, we it's just like we had climbed we'd been climbing that mountain and we were just like it's really happening no nah, yeah no nah, yeah <laughs> then you know a couple more shots you're like it's happening yeah <laughs> you know if we keep so, drinking uh, yeah. yeah so that that's what and i mean and I've, I've heard stories before about that kind of stuff you mean some guys some bands get signed and i know you've heard this story where man we got signed and then we made the record and then it got shelved yep 
you know, and then the record doesn't come out and then you're just like, well, what happens? Then you never hear from the band again. It's like, I mean, at least we didn't get that far in the process. At least we just got to the, we just got to the dance and then they slammed the door so we couldn't get in. So that was, that was, that's that's terrible though. I mean, isn't the point of inviting someone to a label to, I mean, why would you change your mind after you've made the offer? I I mean, I'm sure. And what the common thing is, is that there's more than one person, you know, sure. It's a, it's a committee. Yeah. Yep, it was a yeah, and everything decision. costs money. So some guy could have been on our Friday night drinking and going, this band's pretty awesome. I'm going to talk a big game. And he goes back to his boss and he's like, don't you want to sign this other band? Uh, and then there you go. And on yeah. Monday, it's like, I'm yeah. sober too. <laughs> yeah, for whatever reason. It could be whatever reason they could think of that they could, you know, so. But yeah, so that was that. And, um, you know, after that happened, <clears throat> to fill you in a little bit more, Siobhan, I had this band uh, in Tennessee for about eight years, and mm-hmm. yeah, that was that was pretty much the beginning of the end of it. We played all kinds of showcases for all different labels and all this stuff. And then once that kind of thing happened, like that was the closest we got. Once that happened, it was just kind of like there wasn't any really any more wind in the sails after that. I felt like it was just kind of like, man, how do you get so close? And you know, so so it was time for something new. And I had some mutual friends that knew of this other band Adelita's way that, uh, you know, had just signed with, I think it was Virgin records at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I got an audition with them and then, um, flew to Chicago, did the audition, got the job and, uh, played guitar and sang harmonies and, uh, and wrote a couple tunes, uh, on a few albums. Um, yeah, for four years with that band. That's awesome. Well, how, let me ask, not to interrupt you, but how, how big was the band at the time that you joined? Cause I mean, they're pretty big. I mean, they're big now. And I, you know, that's an interesting experience to audition for a group that already exists. So what was it like going into that and where were they at in their journey? <laughs> they, uh, I think they had a little bit of a, of a following They're They're based out of Las Vegas. They had a little bit of a, some, a buzz going, going on, uh, regionally around their area, probably around LA a little bit. Um, and, uh, but, you know, nationally, I, I feel like they were pretty not well known. Um, mm-hmm. so, and that was, that was the thing is like, you sign the deal, put the songs out and then you just tore your asses off. And so I, I joined right at that point, right. When the record was just, just, uh, had been recorded and it was like, all right, time to get in a van and go play shows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, very cool. Um, yeah, it was interesting for me joining Star Set. And, uh, you know, that was when they had just gotten a bus. And I hear all these stories about them driving around the country in a van and Dustin will talk about it on stage. And it's just funny to come into something, you know, and have to kind of get to know what's going on. Who are these guys? What is this music? How do I fit into this project? So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that that's my whole life, you know, is joining something that has already existed. It's pretty rare that I'm the one starting something, you know, so it's an interesting perspective. Yeah, that's cool that uh, that's pretty awesome you uh you join a band they, they're in a bus already so good for you <laughs> yeah well that, but that's that's a joke about string players is like they're so expensive that you can't really have them until you have the budget for other things too you know wow um, yeah which i mean which is nice but it, you know it, I, I love hearing their stories of how they got into music and you and like a lot of the people we talked to because for me it was pretty square you know you go to the music school you're going to be in an orchestra like classically trained it's like a pretty wow. standard trajectory so it's it's kind of different for me to jump into the world of a lot of people that taught themselves and their experience with music was forming a band. You know, a lot of the people we talked to, it's like, as soon as they knew how to play, they were already playing music, doing covers, writing songs. And for me, it's like, I'm trying to learn that now. <laughs> I've spent my whole life playing. I, I have a metaphor for this. I yeah. have a whole metaphor. I've said this on the show, Keith. I, I, I remember the first time I ever headlined the house of blues was as a DJ. And I was like, fuck, I walked up and I had the whole green room. I had the whole back area. I was like, uh-huh. it's a DJ Benny Goodman. And I'm like, so I get to play the House of Blues as a musical prostitute. Because that's what I did. I was like, people are like, how do you afford those PRS guitars? Oh, not being in a band. I'm a <laughs> DJ. And that's the truth. It's like, because you're a violinist, like, you're right. You're too expensive to be afforded by most bands that don't have a bus. Whereas, like, us measly dudes, like, we have to, like, find out on a Monday we don't have a record contract. You but know? it's a shame, <laughs> though, too, because, I mean, I would have loved to do 
even more fail for, like not being paid no because i think the experience <laughs> like that that's i think why at least with violinists there's a big rift between the classical world and the rock world you know it's like people wouldn't think to ask the classical violinists they're like oh they're too expensive you know but i'm sure there are a lot of people that would love to jam with a band and get that experience and play and tour and it just doesn't happen super often still i mean now more than ever but mm-hmm. you know other than star said there was no other band or group that I played with where it wasn't like a big arena show where it's like, okay, we're going to hire the string section. And it's kind of a, its own thing. It's not really a part of the whole show in like an essential sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Strings are just so easily fit on the backing track. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. (laughs) It's cool though. It's cheaper. It's so cool. I I was telling them uh, about just like the last time we had toured with star set, there was just, you know, four dudes in a band and now I was like, those are all these people. I'm like, who are all these people? But I was like, this is awesome though. Cause like you guys are great and talented. And so I, I can't picture it any other way now. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, well, Justin's you guys like, are awesome. Thank you. Justin says, thank you. He's like, you can't picture it any other way. I've trademarked it. He's like, you have to picture it this way. <laughs> yeah. He's already like a million levels ahead of everyone. So who knows what's in his brain. He's Kaiser Sose. He's the Kaiser Sose <laughs> of the music industry is Dustin. He's like, I, I've just made this all up from the beginning. I just looked <laughs> yeah. at your wall. I looked at the stars and told you what it was. That said, <laughs> so you, you, you've also, you, so you clearly joined a band where you weren't the head guy, but now you're doing a solo career. We're just going to go around breaking Benjamin right now, this huge band that you happen to be in. But I'm like really interested to hear what it's like to go from being the hired gun to being the dude now. Like, I mean, you have multiple solo albums. I see there's one from 2014, but What's it like going back after being in a band like Breaking Benjamin to being the head guy driving the bus for yourself? Uh, well, it's like it's like starting over from scratch, um, but it's, it's challenging. It's terrifying. It's fun. It's uh, exhilarating. It's I don't know. It's it's definitely, you know, I, I, I've gotten used to just, you know, playing in the band and, you know, having, you know, people just looking at multiple people on stage to just me by myself on stage on a plank, just, you know, uh, I mean, that's at least for the acoustic shows that I've done, you know, I'm eventually going to have a full band, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's been a while. So, so long so that it's, it's not in my comfort zone anymore. I think probably, I probably would have been more, comfortable with it back in 2008, you know, after just leading my own band for eight years, you know, I I felt like, uh, I would have been a little bit more comfortable, but now I've been in other bands. And, and so, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different thing, but what was the catalyst to, to kind of start, you know, recording and releasing your own music? Uh, was that always something you were doing on the side, even when you were playing with other acts? Um, I think, it just came down to um, just a simple question. Why not? And, you know, I, I, I try to um, write music on the side. I mean, there's stuff that I'll write. That's just nothing like what breaking Benjamin sounds like. And um, you know, I work, I I write with all kinds of different bands, different genres, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was like, man, it'd be fun to just do something that was just for me, for myself and put it out there and, and uh and why not why not try to do it and plus i don't want to be I, I say this every time and i mean this is this is real and i believe this i don't want to be an old man filled with regret <laughs> and think back and be like why didn't i write more songs why didn't i sing you know why didn't i play more shows why didn't i get out there while i could uh when i could and so COVID, I think, really put it into perspective a lot, too, because, you know, all of our careers were just completely just robbed from us. And uh, so I just thought about it. I'm like, man, if if we ever get a chance again to play a show, you know, because there was times where you're just like, is it over? You know, I remember (laughs) thinking that at one point during, you know, I feel like that now. Is it over? (laughs) Yeah, it could be any day. <laughs> yeah, it could be any day. Yeah, seriously, it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I just want to do it as much as I can while I can. Why not? Let's go. Let's do it. 
No, that's great. And I, I mean, I'll say having been on tour with you a couple months, your last month, I mean, you were working hard. I mean, you were playing the shows and like also working on your solo project, like in the downtime. So in the venue, we were like sitting in the dressing room and he's got stuff going on. Joe's there working on things and good for you. Cause that's, that's really hard for me to do two big things like that at once. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for me too, honestly, cause I'd much rather just, <laughs> I'd much rather just like, Chill. Yeah. Play the show and have fun and eat pizza. And, uh, but yeah, this is, it's, this is a especially busy time for me. It's the busiest I've ever been. And, uh, I try not to complain about it because I asked for it, (laughs) but plus, I mean, I just, I'm just making up for lost time also, I feel like, so I'm sure it's going to slow down and get a little bit more normal here soon, but, um, but yeah, um, just try to, I don't know. I used to play video games a lot and I just, I can't, I can't now because then I'm, I just feel guilty. I'm just like, I could be, I could be doing something else or, you know, even just social media, all the, just the content. I think Mike Shinoda, he had some kind of article or interview that he did. And he was talking about how artists have to just compete and do all this content and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and I forget the quote, but it was something like, you know, you're t- so busy trying to put out all this mindless, numb, you know, mind numbing content when you could have just wrote the best song you've ever written in your life, your first number one hit for all you know. Uh, but, you know, you're making a TikTok video or some dumb shit. So, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. I think about that, too, because like even for me, there's there's a ton of violinists on TikTok and Instagram that are like every day, 10 seconds of something else. And, and I'm like, yeah. should I get into that? And then part like my soul does not want me to because I think about the same thing. It's like, I might as well just spend that time trying to build up to something big. That's like meaningful that you can show, not that it isn't meaningful, but you know, something of yourself rather than kind of having to entertain every day to an audience. It's it's a weird thing to me. It's what's important. It's totally like what's important to you. Like what really matters to you. Exactly. Exactly. You you know what I mean? And, And I think it's, I could be doing TikTok and all that sort of stuff, but I also realized like a while ago, like first off, I'm going to be a Luddite eventually, even though I run a studio, I'm going to not know anything about anything. I already have a 17 year old that lives in the house with me that tells me how I don't know, shows me every day how I don't know anything. So like, it's only a matter of time before we're all just obsolete. So like, why don't we just do what we can while we can and just say, fuck it. You know what I mean? Like, if you can't do TikTok, you're never going to be the best at TikTok. You're never going to ride an algorithmic wave. F that shit. I'm just going to make what this is the best that it can be. And if they give a fuck, cool. (laughs) If they don't, well, I'm stuck being this anyway. So good luck. It does seem like there's a little bit of a movement uh, along the lines of like, you know, the article you quoted that is a lot of artists are being pressured by the label. Uh, to Definitely. basically like yeah. I, I've seen a couple they were like you need to put a viral video out uh, for us to release this single and it's like that is it's gonna swing the pendulum's gonna have to swing back because that is just an unsustainable unrealistic way of, of doing business especially with the music industry being as weird and like shifty as it has been for the past couple decades so I'm, right. I'm curious if there will be some sort of uh, you know rebellion against social media i'm sure that artists that that kind of take that opposite approach might actually be able to gain some um some traction neil young won't do spotify so (laughs) i mean that's rebellion neil winning (laughs) you know it's like not not that you know all social media is bad i mean there's probably i mean what's the alternative me walking up the street and you know stapling a you know you know, I used to have these, that was, that was back in the day too. I had this like hammer stapler and <laughs> it would be like pop, 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 pop. And we just, you know, we'd go yeah. up the street and we got to bring know, back, bring back flyers. That's what we yeah, need. Flyers yeah. on, on telephone poles. <laughs> like that's the alternatives. Now social media, you just, you know, put a blast out, you know? Yeah. There's definitely, there's a, there's a, a line, a threshold where it, it is useful. And then there's a threshold where it becomes a hindrance to the actual music and, and a distraction. Uh, that seems what people are starting to really kind of push back against. Yeah. yeah. I mean, granted, you know, my, this is coming from someone who's never gone viral, who's never had a hit TikTok video. So maybe, maybe I'd be singing a different tune if, if, 
but I don't know. I do. I kind of do sound like the old curmudgeon guy, like, dang kids, I don't get it. But, but I do get it. I'm like you too. I do get it. Listen, I had never watched TikTok and I met this kid in South Carolina, right? And he was like super funny. He was a waiter. And he, he turns out like, I'm like, dude, you should be a comedian. And it turned out he was TikTok famous, had like millions of followers. And watching him talk about how he used to get like 2 million like views to getting only like 100,000 to getting 50 and like his depression level at like 21 oh, years wow. old. This kid was hilarious and yeah. he had gajillions of views, but it went from like seven figures to six figures to like, he had to try really hard. Like, and it was like his whole life was around this. And I'm like, man, that's a yeah. really hard thing being like 21, getting 2 million people to watch your video. And then every day thinking I have to do that again. And then slowly watching it get taken away. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, the mental health, the mental health aspect of it is just crazy. I mean, cause you know, you're constantly comparing yourself to the best in the world, the funniest in the world, the most talented in the world. And, you know, there's just got to do, just got to do you, do you boo boo, be the best <laughs> you, you can be, you know? So, um, since this is our, our, our first, you know, hour our part one, and I just want to make sure we get caught up all the way to present day before we dive into some more, you know, different topics about, you know, your life and, and what you have going on. But can you talk about, uh, you know, uh, after, Adelita's way, how you transitioned and then the space in between and then getting into Breaking Benjamin, which, uh, you know, obviously just as the new guy, a friggin', years a friggin', ago. you know, such a legendary band at this point. Uh, how did that connection come about? Yeah, I uh, there's a similar thing. I went through a kind of a period there where I'm like, who am I? What am I doing with my life? Yeah, I uh, same kind of thing with with Adelita's way. You know, those guys are still out there doing it. Um, you know, much love to those guys. And, and, but I just, I, I kind of reached the point where I was like, I got to do something different. I got to do something new. And, um, so I just decided to leave the band and, and, uh, you know, come what may, you know, I just knew, I just wanted to try something new, whether that be start another band of my own, uh, or just make music somehow. I don't know. Um, so that was I bold. That would, that's amazing. I mean, I, not to stop you in the middle, middle of your story, but I, I don't know that if I, I've ever done that, that's so scary to leave something and just leave it up to the universe, you know, like you're open to anything. I mean, that's, that's really yeah. impressive. Do you think that your prior yeah. experience leaving, you know, the, and disbanding the, the original band helped with that decision? Probably, probably, um, you know, it's kind of like, man, if something, there's gotta be some other path you know, that I'm not even thinking of that. I don't even know about, um, you know, so. Well, you yeah, nailed that it probably, one. <laughs> it, it probably did, you know, it probably nailed did it. have something. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wrote, I wrote this, uh, just a big thank you letter. You know, I, I'd like to thank, you know, Adelita's way and all the amazing fans that I'd met and that had been so supportive of, of me and the band and, you know, the label, the manager, all that stuff. I, I called it my, my manifesto, <laughs> my resignation manifesto. And, and I guess, I guess Ben saw it. Um, and, uh, he, he wrote me on, on Facebook and was like, you know, Hey man, you know, kind of like looking to kind of start trying to, you know, find some, some people to jam with, you know, would, would you want to, you know, uh, give me a ring. And so I called him and he was just like, yeah, dude, just, you know, make some videos of, uh, of yourself, you know, playing the songs and singing some harmonies and stuff. I'm like, okay. And at that point he was looking for a, a lead guitar player, which I am not, I could play some lead, but I am, I'm more rhythm singer songwriter guy. So, uh, <clears throat> but I was like, yeah, sure. I can play lead. Oh, I could shred. <clears throat> and so, you know, I made some videos and sent them in and he was like, these are great, man. You know, um, you know, I'll let you know. I'll talk to you later. I'm like, all right, cool. <clears throat> and I never really, I never really heard back. So I, I figured I was like, either he's just going through a bunch of videos and a bunch of people, or I didn't get the job. So I just was like, all right, well, cool. I'm going to just focus on other things. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I did. I, I tell you what, I didn't go on a houseboat and party all weekend <laughs> thinking I got it, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I was just like, man, I'm, you know, I, I was living in LA at the time. And so I just, I got a job and, uh, whew, God, 
it was soul sucking. It was like, it Can was, you tell us what kind of job? Yeah, I was, I was a, I worked at this place called yummy, uh, in LA. It's basically, uh, de- uh grocery delivery. So people okay. would call and then I would show up with bags with their groceries. And, uh, and some people were super sweet, you know, lots of times it was like elderly people and they were so sweet and appreciative. And you were just like, you know, this is great. The other side of that is, <laughs> you know, I remember one time I delivered to this guy at nine in the morning, he had been up all night. I delivered. Well, first off, you can tell kind of how the people are or how they're going to be by what, what they the, you know what they ordered <laughs> and this guy got a six pack like a 12 six pack of beer at like nine in the morning you know two packs of cigarettes and i'm like oh man this guy's starting early no he had been up all night he had been up all night and uh and it was in hollywood and uh you know and i'm from the south i like i try to be nice to just everybody and i don't know it's just it's just the way southern people are i don't know i'm not really used to just that kind of shit but uh <laughs> assholes yeah assholes and holly and, weird dude and, and, it's fucking weird out there man and and i knocked i knocked on the door and uh i'll never forget this he was just like he's like yeah man uh i was like here's here's your order or whatever he's like yeah thanks he like grabs it and then he just he threw like two dollars down on the floor or down on the ground that was my tip Oh and I was just like, Damn. I was like, this is the most like disrespectful crap I've ever seen. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, so, there, man I've out there, a, if you're listening, we know you. <laughs> I've got a bunch. I've got a bunch of those stories. There was one time I didn't have like correct change. All I had was like ones. And, and I had to give this lady like eight dollars in ones. And that's just all I had. It's not like I was like, ah, I, if I give her once, she'll give me a tip. I was just like, that's all I had. And she was, and she like looked at the money. She was just like, grabbed it, slammed the door in my face. And then I could, I could hear her voice like muffled in her house. She's like, <laughs> like she just yelled fuck in her house. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. Oh, man. I was like, man, she was mad over $8 and change. So oh my gosh. People, people were miserable. People were miserable and it transferred to me. It made yeah. me miserable. And I'm like, this sucks. And so service I was like, industry is a hard one, man. Any yeah, kind it of is. service industry. It's like literally like everyone projects at you. Like that's just, that's the job. It's like you basically absorb everyone's projection in some way. Oh, yeah. That's how I feel about the internet now though. Is like, mm-hmm. I don't even want to look anymore because that's what it is. It's like, I look and everyone's, you know, mad about something. I'm like, why has everyone got to be so mad? <laughs> I All agree. The time. Yeah. Yeah. I I was telling them earlier, like, you know, I just, I just want to be a part of the escape from like putting out music and like making people feel good. And, 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 you know, uh, you know, I just want to be an escape from all the negativity that we're constantly bombarded with every single day on every news channel on every social media feed, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's an excellent mission. I mean, I think we definitely need more of that. Well, and- your concert when we came and saw you was definitely that because I'll tell you this: I I've seen so many bands so many times that like at this point, like I I don't care. I don't really want to leave my house. Like I'm I'm in my I love my studio because when I'm in my studio, it's my safe place. It's where all my guitars are here. I can go over here yeah. and play this and all. It it's one of those things where the more people more peopling you do sometimes the more it makes you go like i just want to go and make the things that make me happy and like for me it's just making yeah. music and even if i'm not a rock star i'll still sit down here and work on music all night because it's certainly better than going out there to the guy that throws dollars at me because i didn't bring or i did bring him his cigarettes and his six pack of beer after he stayed up all night in a crystal meth binge and fucking <laughs> West holly weird like are you fucking serious so like i tip my hat to people uh, that like you just keep getting up and keep doing it. And like, again, I go back to the word lifer, you know what I mean? Cause I'll tell you how yeah. I'm a, a lifer. I played a show in 2000 with this band called breaking Benjamin and they were opening for my band in a band in, in, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And then this band breaking Benjamin got so big that um, it almost <laughs> seems funny now that I said that they opened for my band in 2000 
that they opened for my band and I'm still here in my basement and this is as big as it gets. And then you're in Breaking Benjamin. So I want you to understand that's almost like my Friday. I got a record contract deal. Because I told, I told Siobhan, I'm like, wait, who are you playing with? She's like, Breaking Benjamin. I'm like, they're playing places that big? She's like, oh, they're huge, man. Because like, I'm in my own world. I'm, under, I'm underground. I'm like, I think those dudes opened for me in 2000. And then I'm like, I go out to the real world. I'm like, everyone knows Breaking Benjamin. And every, the entire crowd singing every single song. My fiance knew all your tunes. And I'm like... <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, I went to that show. Uh, I, I bought tickets to that show before I even knew Star Set was on it. Oh, not to not to interrupt you, but this is the notorious show right before everyone got sick, so they were there. Oh, yeah, that this, night. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah, this this was this was a. Uh, oh, you got <laughs> wicked yeah, sick in my house, show, Siobhan. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, food sorry, poisoning. Corey, Wait, no, you ate the food poisoning. I was just saying, like you were talking about the you know, the uh, the ubiquitousness of uh, Breaking Benjamin. But I bought tickets to that for my wife for her birthday before I even knew Siobhan was going to be there. And I don't go to shows unless Siobhan can get me in for free. So you know that was a big deal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, it was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was such a good time. But sorry, y'all got sick. <laughs> yeah, I saw you guys, and then the only other guy I went and saw was Paul McCartney. So that tells you my level of fucks oh, wow. given for live shows at this point. I was well, like, I saw well, you guys, and I saw Paul at Fenway the other night, which was really nice. Even well, though we, his voice is kind of gone, but it is what it is. Yeah. Well, we're, we're honored. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, what, what, what was your band called? Oh, back in the day, Carve. We were in a band called Carve Carve. that mattered for like two seconds. See, here's the thing. We that's what we did. We 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 released a song. It was on K Rock. We were beating out like I think System of a Down and uh, you know all Incubus and Three Eleven were all out at the same time. And we were like charting because WSOU in Jersey was just blowing us up. Stern jammed us the whole nine. We so we made the first half of the record, and then by the second half of the record, we, we were touring, doing all, and then like our singer was like our other our other singer who felt underappreciated because I sang and he screamed. It was like one of those early things. Wanted to go back to school. And uh, we're like, but we're on tour with 10,000 people. Like with, there's like Rob Zombie and then Filter and Seven Dust. He's, but I think I want to go back to school. And I think it was for English. I'm not even kidding. And that broke up our band. He wanted to, he was like, I can't do this anymore. Damn. <laughs> true story. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking it. true. So Carve. Breaking Benjamin, you opened for us, not you, because you weren't in the band then, because that was 22 right. fucking years ago. Right. Holy shit. <laughs> right. It happens. Yeah, some, you know, there's a lot of people, they're like, man, I'm like away from my friends and family an awful lot. Like, well, yeah, that's what uh, that's what this is. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of just dawns on them then and there at that moment, you know, so I believe it. Yeah. yeah. It happens. No, absolutely. There's a lot of side of resilience of a musician that you get to see. Like you're a perfect example of it. Like, dude, like literally like, that, like, you know, you judge somebody on how they keep getting back up after, you know, travesty after travesty, because like every, like every story you said could have been the end. And then, and then I went back to office max and stayed there, <laughs> but instead it's like, you know, you're, uh, I didn't yeah. stay there fortunately. And now yeah. I just stay in my basement. Um, but I think that that's an amazing sign of resilience and how hard it is. Cause I know there's a lot of people that go and see, you know, huge bands, like they'll see a band like Breaking Benjamin and they can't possibly fathom that you ever went through anything other than just being a rock star. And it's just never, it's never the story unless you're a violinist. <laughs> <laughs> I, wouldn't sure. I wouldn't say it's easy for me then i think you were making it sound like it was more of a piece of cake than it this is, is my but, heckling but... you for being 15 late minutes late to your own show you rock star i, oh, love I was that. 30 give, give yeah. me the benefit of the full 30 that i was Corey late. edited out 15 of them it's fine <laughs> you didn't have to tell him yeah. yeah it's uh you know yeah i'm sure i'm i'm sh- you know siobhan who knows i mean all the you know stuff you've been through also you know people don't know they they just see the the glossy you know well it's yeah. different yeah siobhan has stuff i'm not going to speak for her but like what she tells me it's different being like a super talented woman in a world like today you know so the problems that she has i'm sure are 
I wouldn't even know some of the things that she's gone through. But at the same time, it's not the you're with a bunch of smelly dudes in a band room saying on a Friday you're gonna be in you know signed, but like, and then Monday no more. But then at the same time, yeah, (laughs) to not be there, yeah, you got to supersede that. But you know, there's other things I'm sure, Siobhan. Well, yeah, well, the overall lesson is you, you have to keep going. You know, if music is what you love and that's what you want to do, you just have to keep going because there's going to be a million stop points, you yeah. know. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Keith, it looks like you've been you've been doing that pretty well. So it's, I think you've made some some good decisions, good, hard decisions that uh, seem to have worked out pretty well for you. Uh, we're coming to the end of our first hour, uh, part one. Um, so, you know, thank you for sharing kind of your, your journey, you know, up until this point. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to diving a little bit deeper in part two. Um, do you want to just give a shout out or, or just tell people where they can find you and, and like find your original music and, and what's going on with the touring schedule and everything? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all my music's on Spotify, Apple Music. Um, my website is www.keithwallen.com. <laughs> I'm on all social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. It's the same handle at I'm KJ following Wallen, you now at KJ Wallen and uh, Facebook is just my name. Keith Wallen music. Yeah, we're going to help you there go you viral. Go. That's that's going to be the trick. That's, <laughs> <laughs> <No>. you, <laughs> after I just shit talk it. <laughs> <laughs> Part two. I love TikTok. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I didn't mean any of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, uh, check out 2020-d.com, like and subscribe to the podcast, and we will see you next week. Take it easy. I see you on TikTok. I, I, I get lost in that thing sometimes because okay. the, the amount of talent that's out there. Can I tell you that the best talent in the world will never be signed? Oh, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Never. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and you'll never know them, probably. You'll just come across them one day. And but they have no interest. Touring is hard. Everyone thinks that it's, you know, hey man, you're out there and then it's awesome, but it's you know can you leave your family? Can you leave your friends? Can you and for years? It's like you're gone. You know, three hundred days out of the year in the beginning is what we were doing and Oh my god. So that's a that's a hard act that's a hard thing to do.